Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is Wednesday and time for the Knowledge Bolide Hangout. You are looking at the beautiful sunset from our Knowledge Bolide member, Cameron Smith, out in Alabama. I forget the exact town, but very beautiful backyard. A lot, a lot more moisture than in my backyard. <laughs> so uh, we're really glad you guys joined us today. We're going to be having a, a little bit um, shorter than normal hangout, I would imagine. Um, but I'm also, because I have to bug out a little early today, but I'm going to leave the reins in Pat Brown's hands. So if you guys are talking about something after I leave and you guys want to record it, we're all for that. Um, since I mentioned... Since I mentioned Pat Brown, uh, you were on with us yesterday during the, uh, hold on, let me do this, and spotlight, there we go. You were on with us yesterday during the uh, European hangout that we had. Yes, we had a, uh, we had a really nice hangout, uh, wonderful turnout of, of some some uh, first timers uh, who had sent in video and such before, and it was really cool to to chat with them live. Uh, Damian did a uh, unboxing video on mm -hmm. uh, a new meteorite for his uh, for his outreach work, um, and but he posted a video on uh, YouTube too with uh, a whole bunch of different lighting types and some of his magic photography is really quite stunning. But we yeah, my, had uh, the piece that I saw that he showed that really caught my attention was that lunar trocolite. Ah, uh, yes, it in in and the the little custom holder that he made with the backlight on it that was, uh, <laughs> that was really quite cool. Yeah, he has a little piece of uh, NWA seventy eight thirty one uh, diagonite, and it, it's just a little thin slice, and he put it in a little case and put a backlight on it with a little button. Did a good job on it. Yes. Yes, yeah, and his his uh, close up photos of the uh, uh, of the lunar troctolite are uh, were really quite amazing too. The uh, he showed uh, really close up detail of one of the glass veins in mm -hmm. uh, in that meteorite that was just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, um, I was I was really happy that I got to see that, and like yesterday was really nice for the hangout to be. It was nine a.m. my time in Arizona. Uh, 6 a.m. Eastern time, but like 6 p.m. in uh, in France, Spain, that type of, of time zone. So we had, I think we had Marco Geyser in Germany. Uh, we had um, um, Damian in Croatia. We also had Jem Thomas from the UK. We had uh, someone with us from uh, Canada. And I think we had some other... Um, European guys with us as well. Yeah, but, sorry, I'm not coming up with all the names off the top of my head. Uh, yeah. Marissa was there with us. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was happy to to have her with us. Let me remove the spotlight and remove the spotlight. <clears throat> Warren Mahoney and Donald Hurd was there too. Oh yeah, Donald Hurd in in Scotland checking in with his microprobe machine. Yes, yeah. yes that that was that was wonderful to uh, to see that machine. Boy, that's. Uh, that's a big, big time toy. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> I think I'm, I think we're actually going to do those uh, on a regular basis. So if a morning hangout or a European hangout appeals to you time-wise, uh, stay tuned for more information on that. Um, let's check in with Maxime, one of our European buddies right now. Yeah, you're on mute, but you're spotlighted. How are you, man? Yes, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. And so, yes, today I will just switch my camera to my rear. Okay, so I have three specimens I wanted to show you today. So first I will start with th this one. So this is a little Gaugwini uh, specimen, which uh, has a very nice shape, aerodynamical shape. So it's a bit like a nose cone. And if you look closely, you can even see some kind of regmaglips here, but they were quite uh, weathered and yes, we don't see them as good as they was when the meteorite was still fresh, I guess. But yes, the shape is quite nice. Nice backside too. <laughs> yes, the backside is very, 
very nice. Not frothy anymore, but I guess that when this meteorite way was still fresh, here it was a, a quite frothy fusion crust. And you have some roll overlap. Yes, maybe too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yes, here. Yeah. Oh, nice. So yes, it's it's a nice example of oriented Gaugueni specimen. Beautiful shape. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so yes, very nice. I like that. And next for the two others, two are um, meteorites from the meteorite of the Mount Club subscription. So this what this is the the one from last month from June. So this is um, Eucrite with a very nice dual lithology, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it is not classified yet, but um, I think it is suspected to be a Euc Eucrite melt breccia. Yes. So you can see it, here. Is it, is it still under classification right now? Yes, I think uh, Daniel Sheik uh, is uh, doing the classification. Okay. Um, so it, it will be classified very soon, but uh, no number at the moment. So it is can very we, nice. Yeah, I was going to say, can we see? Well, that's a thick slice, buddy. Absolutely. Yes. yes wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was surprised when I saw that in the package. Very thick and yes, beautiful. Wow. Very nice. I really like the dark part here that you can see on both sides of the, mm -hmm. of the slice. Which is yeah, there's a vesicle in the dark area there on the back. Yes, I think it is right here. Yes. Quite nice. It's a nice example of uh, Ukraine. And I think the dark part here is, uh, is the melt part, if I am not wrong. So... Yeah, that looks right to me, especially with a vesicle on the back. Yes. So nice example. Very and then the last one is the one that uh, this one I received it today. This is a uh, July meteorite of the month. And this is a uh, Martian shergutite. shergutite. Mm. So this is, um, wow. Yes. You know, it's, re it's reversed, but it's, it is NWA 13187. Yeah. It's a. Uh, a nice size, uh, I think, for a Martian. So I did not had any, uh, I did not have any Martian uh, of this size before. I'm really happy with that one. Yeah, not very many people, percentage-wise, in this world can claim that they have Mars. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and, and be <laughs> and be accurate about or be correct about it. <laughs> <laughs> or Vesta, yeah. for that matter. Yeah. Exactly. Ooh, what's that white line on there? I think this is, um, that comes from the, um, we'll try to open it. That comes from the slicing process. Oh, okay. It's, it's difficult okay. to open it, but it's like um, a small, uh, a little, I don't know the word in English, but. A blade oh. artifact or something like it, that? Yeah, it's a score yeah. line. Those were scores and snaps. Oh, gotcha. Uh, Thank you. So, yes. Yeah, mine has it too. Okay. It's like they were using a super slicer. Okay. Hmm. That's, that's a very nice size uh, piece of, uh, of Mars for uh, 50 or 100 US a month. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the meteorite of the month club is really a good deal. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, R Roberto is a, is a knowledge bolide crew member and he is the one who fulfills those orders and writes out the COAs along with his partner, uh, Mark Lyon. <clears throat> wow. And it's also, it's also really awesome to just get something every month that's a surprise. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I, uh, I haven't signed up yet, um, and I keep saying I'm going to, but I never do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah we'll keep we'll keep plugging them as long as they're in existence yeah um that's awesome Th thanks and that uh that slice of mars maxime for i think i saw 0.7 grams that has a lot of large surface area yes yeah. yes it's quite quite thin actually so uh, that was what i was looking for uh actually i was looking for um 
a sheep slice of Mars with a nice surface area. And that was exactly what, what I wanted and I was not expecting that today. So that was perfect. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and I'm glad it came on Wednesday for us. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Well, definitely glad to have you on board with us today. Glad you're on a holiday, yeah. as you guys say over there. I'm happy to be here too. Thank you. Nice. Hey, uh, we have Art Wagner in the building. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I got a uh, 48.5 gram vodka mortar. It's an end cut. And... Uh, Oh, yeah. And uh, it almost looks like a loosely consolidated rubble uh, pile. Mm -hmm. I think that because of being in that dry desert, chilly for so long, it, uh, it didn't do a lot to help it, but uh, I wouldn't have expected it to rain in the desert. So as far as freezing and thawing, with uh, water inside those cracks. Uh, no, I just think it uh, baked in the sun and then at nighttime it uh, froze. <laughs> so yep. but, uh, it's a nice end cut. And this is a, uh, a special type of mesosiderite. It's classified as a 1A. And there are only seven, according to the Met Bowl, of that classification as of this time known to be in the world. Hmm. This is not the one that killed the cow, though. Yeah. Because <laughs> there were many stones that fell. I, I think in 2016, if I'm not wrong, they found some more from this fall. I, I don't I don't know about that recent discovery. All, all I know is <clears throat> there are some Vuaca that you that you get <clears throat> that are extremely weathered and yes. and look like the one you have there. Um, but you, what you want to do is find one like that that has enough um, solidity because that cuts that cut surface shows no cracks in it whatsoever. So mm -hmm. whoever cut that well error light wherever they got it from or whoever cut it for them or if they cut it themselves i'm not sure uh they did yeah. a good job cutting it to maximize the end cut for you yes yes yeah i couldn't i couldn't resist uh so i've kind of put myself on a little time out <laughs> as far as uh more purchases but i i didn't have one so i had to get it <laughs> all right <laughs> Well, everyone needs a Vlaca Muerta in their collection. Oh, yes. So, awesome. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. That, by the way, Arthur, that was a great presentation. I totally enjoyed your, your narrative. Um, it, was, it was done very well today. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, um, thank you, Art. It was impressive. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm still learning and... Uh, I still, I guess, I'm not walking yet. I'm still crawling, but I'm going to get later. <laughs> well, um, it's just, uh, you know, no, no, uh, no anxiety. We're, we don't judge anyone. You know, it, this is a, this is a friendly, safe space, uh, and but it's it's nice to hear um, a, a great presentation and introduction to a meteorite like that. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank um, you. At this time, I'm going to ask for one of our resident geologists to take a little bit of the center stage, Mike Kelly, that is. Um, we had a viewer on YouTube, uh, a comment. Um, I, I always ask people for what they'd like us to discuss, if they have a, if they have a topic uh, that they don't understand um, that we can highlight. And the subject of basalt was brought up and more specifically lunar basalt. So I unfortunately don't remember the YouTube commenter, but hopefully I told them to pay attention to this Wednesday because I'd have Mike Kelly answer that. So I'm gonna turn the stage over to Mike Kelly and kind of the, the, the it's not really a question as much as please explain to us what a basalt is, how it differs from other rocks, um, how 
a lunar basalt is created or basically any information on, on basalts and lunar basalts, we'd really appreciate it, Mike. Yeah, certainly. Um, so when you talk about rocks, you're talking, uh, you know, each rock has some certain characteristics. And when you get to basalts, uh, what you're looking at is you're looking at a characteristic where uh, the rock itself has a fine grain texture. Uh, so when you, you look at fine grained uh, minerals within a rock, that's usually the uh, caused by the rate at which they cooled when you're talking about uh, igneous rocks. So basalt is a fine grain igneous rock, which means that it's a rock that cooled quickly, which means it was able to get rid of its heat really fast. And that's usually a function of being extrusive. So that means it came out of a volcano on either the surface of the earth or the surface of another planetesimal or moon uh, and was able to cool really quickly. And that quick cooling caused the minerals uh, grains to be very small. Okay, um, Mike, I have, a, I have a question to interrupt you with. <clears throat> yeah, sure. How is igneous and basalt, basalts different? I know that basalt is a type of igneous rock, so I'm guessing igneous is more overreaching. Yes, yeah, so it, an igneous rock is, is a, a rock that came about from the, uh, the cooling of a uh, magmatic body, magma, lava. If it hits the surface, magma, if it's underground. So yeah, so a basalt is a type of igneous rock, and igneous rock is the overarching uh, group of rocks, uh, whereas you also have metamorphic rocks, um, and sedimentary rocks. So, so igneous talks about a, a magmatic formation uh, of origin. Thank um, you. Yeah, no problem. And then other characteristics when you start looking at rocks are, are what are the, the minerals inside of them? So each rock is made up of multiple different types of minerals. Um, and so when you talk about basalts, what you're talking about is a rock that has a lot of um, what they call mafic minerals inside of it. So mafic minerals are, are minerals that are uh, either have iron or manganese in them. Uh, so those are your, your two kind of uh, elements that, that lead to uh, mafic rocks. And the major minerals in there are typically olivines and, and pyroxenes. Um, so basalt is going to have a lot of olivine and pyroxene in there, and it's going to have a lot of iron uh, and emin inside of it. Um, and then they don't always have to be uh, extrusive. So again, that was where it gets all the way up to the surface and comes out. Um, if, if the magma gets into little tiny little feeders that they call sills and dikes and gets close enough to the surface, it'll still cool really quickly uh, and you'll still get that same kind of fine grain texture to it. Okay. Um, so that's a, a basalt as a whole and uh, give you, I, I brought a couple of different things out to, to show to give you oh, examples. Awesome. So this is, you know, uh, again, they are mafic, so they're high in iron and high in uh, and manganese, so they are going to be dark. Uh, so, you know, just like when you look at the moon, you see the darker mares and you see the lighter highlands. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's a function of the fact that, you know, the basalts are, are typically blacks to dark grays. Um, there are some kind of uh, lighter colored basalts in there. Um, but the majority, you'll get like this. Um, so, so Mike, this, is that a volcanic bomb? So this is a volcanic ashtray. Um, oh, so this, okay. this rock is, is about uh, 10 years old now. Uh, and it was pulled out of a bit of uh, flowing lava with a stick. Whoa. Uh, and, Whoa. Uh, and it was uh, basically formed right, uh, right in front <laughs> of where I was at. Jeez. Cool. So yeah, that's uh, that's that's a piece of uh, of of lava from Hawaii nice. uh, that was was intentionally taken out and hardened, so I have a pristine specimen. Cool, that's way cool. Yeah, um, but yeah, uh, you know, compositionally, uh, if you were to take a a, a uh, basalt from the moon, uh, and basalts aren't just from the Earth or the moon, uh, there are basalts that we know of uh, from Vesta. And we call those the Eucrate from uh, from the head group. We also have basalts from Mars, uh, uh, which would be the main group would be the Shergatites. Um, but there are also there's the uh, the pairings of Black Beauty seventy thirty four, mm -hmm. uh, which is polymicked uh, breccia basalts, uh, and we also have uh, eighty fifty nine, which is uh, augite basalt. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. 
Um, oh, and then it, it, I never, yeah, knew, I never knew that Eucrites were basalt, and they're the only vessel that are basalt. So or they start to kind of blend. So the non-cumulate Eucrites are are like a true basalt. Mm -hmm. um, the the thing with basalts is again, it's kind of a combination of minerals and the size of the grain. So as you get deeper and deeper, and you hold more of that heat, and the crystals can form for a longer time, you start getting larger crystals, and you kind of transition from a true basalt uh, to what's called a, a diorite, uh, which is a, mm -hmm. just basically, it's, it's the same composition, but just slightly larger crystals. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as you get deeper, you, you transition out of, out of that uh, into a gabbro, uh, which is even coarser, which you'll hear that term for lunar gabbros. Yeah. Same thing, you know, compositionally, it's the same minerals in there. The, the grain structure is just a little different, a little larger. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we got basalts from all over the place. And, and I know part of the viewer's question was, well, what's the difference? And if you took a lunar basalt and you held it up in front of a, a geologist and, you know, they weren't looking at it under a, a microscope uh, set up for petrology and, and looking at thin sections, uh, you know, if it doesn't have a crust to it, it looks like every other basalt. It, to really get down into the differences, it's, it's really a difference in the mineral and chemical compositions in the basalts. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of the main uh, defining characteristics on the lunar basalts is uh, typically they, they trend to be a lot higher in titanium content uh, than earth will be. So like an average earth basalt is going to have less than 1% titanium in it uh, content wise. The mm -hmm. basalts on the moon, um, the lunar mare basalts are divided up kind of into three groups. The, there's a group called the very low titanium content. There's a medium to low titanium content, and then there's a high titanium content basalt. Um, but even on the very lows, you're looking at above a percentage for the most part, uh, and it ranges all the way up to I think the highs are around 13% titanium wow. content. That's so there's a high. lot more. Yeah. yeah, like I said, when you when you get into it, and a lot of that's trapped in a mineral called ilmenite, which is iron titanium oxide. Um, What's it called which, again? Uh, ilmenite. Ilmenite, okay. Yeah. So again, if you just look at a lunar basalt in mass, it, you know, it it looks like an earth basalt. Uh, mm -hmm. You take it, you throw it under the scope or under the sem, uh, and you'll see that, that compositionally it, they run on different trends. And that's that's the same cool. thing with the Martian basalts too. So that, you know, the, the lunars are a little bit harder than the Mars ones because their um, oxygen isotope composition is, you know, basically sitting on the, the TFL line, the terrestrial mm -hmm. uh, fractioning line, like earth. Um, but you can look at that chemical composition and you'll start seeing things like a titanium difference. Uh, the other big difference with the lunar basalts uh, is they typically have a lot higher iron content than the earth basalts do. Hmm. Um, so they'll be rich in iron uh, compared to manganese. Uh, they'll be high in titanium and uh, not to get too deep into the weeds, but there's not a whole lot of oxygen on the moon uh, and there really isn't any water on the moon. Um, so you don't really think of lava as being something that has a lot of water in it. Uh, but earth uh, magmas and lavas actually are relatively high content of moisture. So when they form minerals, they'll form minerals in there that have moisture in the mineral structure. Whereas on the moon, no moisture, no, uh, no. no minerals in there with any moisture in them. So you'll get different minerals that are, that are all anhydrous, all devoid of water. Um, so can you use the term viscous in lunar basalts? So yeah, that's another interesting uh, point about basalts, right? So ours are, uh, you know, high in moisture content, lower in iron. So the higher iron content in the lunar basalts actually cause them to flow more. So mm -hmm. if you look at uh, the way basalts work on Earth, a lot of times you'll have a cone like you see the volcanoes in Hawaii. It's not, it's not very steep, but it's, you know, it's, it's a hill. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the moon, the, the basalts, uh, lava is so high in iron content that it flows very easily. Uh, and so you don't really get like hills and mounds of it. It flows out and forms these big flat puddles and layers, uh, what they call flood basalts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why you kind of see them in the, uh, the mare areas. So the mare areas were large, very large impact craters. Uh, and there's a couple of different theories, you know, but uh, uh, one of the theories goes that, um, the impact craters uh, basically fractured the underlying rock uh, and kind of helped to give a path um, for these melt pockets of, of magma underground to seep up and in. And that's why they form the mares. 
So would these and then they throw out of... like an alluvial fan, these basalts? Um, they... Well, yeah. Well, an alluvial fan is going to start at a higher point and, and flow downhill. These are kind of going to be the opposite. They're going to come out of the lowest point and start yeah. pooling, but it's so so uh, low viscosity that it's going to, like a, like a motor oil, think of. It's going to flow out and go as far as it can. Uh, and, and that's why it fills up all the mares and all the low spots. Uh, what very about the temperatures of each flow? Would the temperatures be similar or? Um, so they can, and they have looked at the temperatures and the temperatures are kind of different. And you look at the, the minerals that pull out and I believe, uh, don't quote me off the top of my head, I believe it's uh, 1200 degrees C is what they're kind of looking at as the temperature uh, for the lunar basalts. Uh, and they can kind of look at the material that pulls up so, you know, the, the theory with the moon is uh, the moon was, you know, like a complete melt, right? And then things started to um, crystallize and you start with certain minerals that crystallize at a higher temperature and you slowly start to settle those out. And those are called cumulates, right? So they, they form first and settle out. And then the mix you have left doesn't have those same chemicals in it. So as the temperature starts to cool, the next mineral forms and comes out. Mm. Um, so they look at it and uh, looking at the different bits of basalt that we have either as meteorites or as uh, lunar return samples. Um, you know, they have about uh, 24 or 25 different kind of um, basalt chemistries that they've looked at. And they're not all the same. So they're saying that um, this lava that's forming these basalts, it's different in each, in each area. Uh, and it's melting from different parts of the moon's mantle. And that's what's coming up. And, and the different parts that melt, since it's only regional and isolated, it, it has a different composition and you'll get a different basalt out of it. it so they can nice look at the temperatures. What was that? No, it, I was just thinking it would be nice to have a complete full slice of the moon itself. Yeah. And you can see all, <laughs> all, the, all the, like a tree ring. Yeah, you yeah. can see, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and they, they, they look at it, and since it's cumulate, you know, if you had a, a melt pocket that was deeper, it would pull up uh, a different set of minerals than if you had a melt pocket that was shallow. Um, and the numbers I've kind of uh, seen in different papers are, are, are around the 500 to like 200 uh, kilometer range is what they're saying is the depth of these different uh, isolated melts that are coming up to the surface and producing um, lunar basalts. Um, and again, what's interesting about the basalts is there's, you know, if you look at the moon, uh, the mares versus the highlands, uh, the mares, and there's no wonder that we don't have quite as many uh, mare basalt meteorites. They're pretty rare. Mm. Uh, the mare basalts only cover about 17, I think it is, total percent of the, of the lunar surface. Uh, if you look at it in some papers, other papers have it up, I think, around uh, 26%. Um, and it's not all even, too. The, f the near side of the moon has a lot higher percentage of mare basalt than the far side of the moon, which is down to like, I think it's like 2%. Hmm. Um, so the formation of those, uh, those mare areas was, you know, whatever the cause was of them is, is not evenly distributed around the moon. This must have happened early in the moon's uh, uh, coalescence or whatever. If there was a crash between the moon and the earth as some science is trying to to say, but right now the moon's core is cool. And so what's gonna generate the uh, magma plumes uh, to form? And like you said, it, it's not exploding out of a volcano. It's more or less just like your coffee cup overflowing and just dribbles out. So none of that is happening uh, anymore. Um, I assume. Yeah, so um, they actually look at, you know, I was telling you about high titanium uh, and, and kind of lower titanium um, uh, breakups as far as how they divide up the, the lunar basalts. So they actually correlate to different ages too. So the higher titaniums are older and the, the lower titaniums are kind of uh, more, uh, more modern. And when I say modern, they're still uh, like three... 1,600 uh, million years old, um, you know, and so they are all uh, relatively old. And the theory on the formation is, right, the entire moon, like you said, started out as a magma ocean. It all solidified. It formed a crust, which floated to the top, and then it formed a mantle. And eventually that entire mantle um, hardened. 
Uh, and there are a couple of different theories out there on, on where you're getting the heat from. Uh, one of the popular ones is, is along the same lines as, uh, you know, what melts the planetesimals and that's uh, radioactive content, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the melts are in regions where there's enough concentration of uh, radioactive um, isotopes that are decaying and releasing heat that you create a, a magma by uh, radioactive uh, um, heat. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, yeah Mike, the, uh, uh, Mike, uh, I have one. I have one question regarding the uh, the metal. You were talking about um, the higher titanium content uh, as lunar has versus terrestrial, and you also mentioned iron. Um, I correct me if I'm wrong, please, because that's why I tapped you on the shoulder today. Um, you are not talking about free metal, meaning observable metal. Yes, correct. Yeah, this is metal that's bound up in the actual mineral structures, right? So it, it's iron and magnesium and titanium uh, in minerals. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's not free metal. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the free metal you're seeing in there is typically the result of, uh, you know, uh, leftover bits of impactors on the moon, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that helped eject some of the material to Earth. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, uh, not native uh, metal. Sweet. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And I really appreciate you taking the 24-hour uh, notice on your uh, scientific presentation today. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And actually, uh, you know, since we were, we were talking about them, like I said, there are, uh, you know, it's not just the moon. It's not just Earth. We got, uh, let me get the camera here. We got the Ukraine's, you know, off of, uh, off of Vesta uh, that are also considered basalts. Like I said, you got the, the shergatites, which are, uh, are Martian basalts, along with uh, augite basalts. And again, all augite, all augite is, is it's a form of um, pyroxene. Uh, so it, it's one of like the pure end members of pyroxene. Uh, so this just happened to be a basalt that only has augite, well, mostly only has augite in it as, as the um, pyroxene content. Uh, Black Beauty pairings, again, those are the polymix. Uh, and there's something like, I think the new studies say there's something like 14 or more uh, different lithologies of basalt in there. Yeah. Um, and what's, what's cool about those is they look at the different basalts in there uh, and they're not compositionally um, similar. So they're from different magmatic bodies that have all kind of blended together over time as different melts kind of pooled up uh, onto the surface. Uh, so those are pretty cool. That's amazing. That's another different layer in the uh, original body. Uh, so either from a, like a deeper origin or or a lateral piece that kind of like you know sometimes the the magmas will penetrate up and like I said they form uh, uh, sills and dikes. So that's where they're either cutting up or cutting across. Uh, so sometimes they'll they'll cut across a weak layer uh, and you'll get yeah you'll get a a, a um, isolated magma from a different area kind of intruding over and laterally. Um, and then, of course, since the topic was lunar basalts, there's a uh, NWA 032, which I've showed off before, which is a, a true lunar mare basalt. Mm -hmm. nice. Very nice, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And if you got any questions, yes, by all means, by ask away. What was the NWA number on that lunar right there? Zero. That's uh, 032. Oh, my God, dude. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's beautiful, dude. That's a huge hunk of, of an early, early lunar. Holy monkey. Yeah, I was I was very happy to find that because lunar basalt was uh, was on my list for a long time of, of, of keeping an eye out. Wow. Fantastic, man. Hey, uh, I really appreciate you again presenting. I, you have your hand up. Is that for uh, what you wanted, what we did already? I got some more stuff if you want to see. Yeah, we're going to we're going to keep rolling with you to thank you for your uh presentation. Yeah, so, no problem. Um, so, I uh got together with uh John and I was very happy to upgrade my Vanalis. Oh. Um, so, I had I had a slice that was 7 grams. So, this is uh uh 3 quarters of an individual with a nice shock on the one side where it's broken open and mm -hmm. and nice crust on the other side. So that's a 22 gram upgrade from John. It's much appreciated. Um, and then the, the real cool thing for this week, this is what I showed in the uh, uh, in the uh, Hangout crew chat. 
Uh, so this is NWA 12769. So this is an IVB. So there are, uh, there are 18 of those, I do believe. Um, and along with that, I picked up a little bit of Hoba Shale. So ah. again, right. that's uh, the world's <laughs> largest single meteorite. I'm uh, still on the search for a bit of uh, pure iron of it, not uh, not oxides. But yeah, it looks there's... like it has a little metal in it, though. Does it? Does it? Yeah. Or is that the um, they'll, they'll yeah, they'll get that with the lighting. Even even the oxides. I mean, if you take a piece of hematite and you cut it and polish it, it looks like metal. Oh. Um, so it's it's got a luster to it, and that's just the nature of of iron oxides. For... Oh, okay majority of them um but taking that piece and this is the cool part and putting it at the end over here there we go that is now a complete set <laughs> of all of the main group irons that's wow. crazy <laughs> so, so there's a full slice of taza that is an iron ungrouped representative mount dueling uh, a recrystallized 1c a wow. gudal Moving into the twos, 2AB. This was the hardest one to get. Kumarina, I showed this uh, about a month ago. That's a, a 2C. There's only, I think, seven of those. Yeah, I've never heard of it besides you. <laughs> one of Topher's favorites. Yeah. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves nothing. 2D iron. I might be cheating. I might switch this one out. This is a uh, siderite aspect of Sayem Chen. Oh, nice. So be before it was a palisite, it was an iron. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they found the palisites, and that, that is all iron member. Uh, this will get upgraded, Balambala 2F. Uh, this is Guanaco 2G. Nice Australian henberry piece with a little cup shape to it. Nice. Into the three ABs. This is a NWA 3E, Nelson County, US, Kentucky. Everybody needs a good Munialustia. So this is kind of a cool one. That's actually a, a bit of a uh, crystal that's been busted out. Uh, oh, so it's, nice. it's got all the planes sitting on it, and the, the top's truncated, so it's a little uh, tetrahedron, I guess. Cool. Uh, and that's a 4A. And then finally, that 4B completes the set. Wow. Nice. Um, that is amazing. And so if that, yeah, there are spreadsheets or little graphs out there that show you what all the classifications mean. If, if you want a copy of it, I, I can send it to you. Um, but it shows the breakdown of how they're classified and how, you know, what each classification means. But Mike is one of our, our class hunters, our class hounds. And every time he completes, uh, every time he completes one of his rows, it's just quite impressive because some of them are just unbelievably hard to get so thank you very much was was that the uh the end of your show and tell yeah that's it thanks for letting me share awesome man thank you so thank much you, thank yeah. you Re really good job today on explaining basalts uh i i learned um now i know something i you know i'll never forget that basalts are fine grained they're part of the igneous class uh, and I can go on. I'll probably rewatch this hangout just to learn more about basalt. So thank you. Um, Pat Brown, I see you smiling over there. Let me highlight you, buddy. All right. So I've got uh, a few different things to show. This one is a uh, an LL 3.15 uh, NWA 13297. Oh, that's beautiful. And believe it or not, this is not cut. This is just a little fragment. That, that side shows some crust. But uh, this side, no crust. And uh, amazing. that's just amazingly amazing. beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing. And, uh, Man, that is beautiful. Then some uh, hope they are primitives. Get this one to focus. There we go. This is one that I've I've shown before, but uh, I love looking at this one in the uh, in the reflected cross polarized light. This one's uh, in line for the saw. Boy, look at that big green chondral on that. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Whoa. 
Yeah, and it's it's sticking out from the surface. Oh, that's crazy. And then this is one from also unclassified from um, Stephen Amara that is a particularly beautiful little, uh, probably primitive, but it's not uh, not been classified yet, but it's uh, it'll be submitted soon. And then the last one to show is a uh, is a fragment. Wow, That's uh, about uh, 732 grams, and it looks okay from a ways Whoa. away. But it looks pretty good close up too. Wow, amazing! That is a starry night of chondrules, man. Oh, wow. yeah, and it's amazing. pretty much, pretty much nothing but chondrules. Wow. Yeah, way too much, too many rocks. They're in there. Uh, Cheek by jowl. Talking about cheeks and jowl, uh, Maxime, you're drooling. <laughs> <laughs> I see you drooling. <laughs> wow. That's Meteor amazing. Meteorite Mansion 2020 uh, purchase. Beautiful. Wow. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know how many individual chondrules there might be in 732 grams of this, but I'd say quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then a slight detour from that. This is a uh, class Ooh. 5 PV3. Uh, 18223, I think. Uh, but this is a reduced CV3. So no free metal. I'm sorry, uh, uh, reduced. There is free metal, uh, really? not oxidized metal. But yep. I particularly like that nice big chondrule on that. Yeah. Side. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Perfectly round. Yep. It looks like a human brain to me. <laughs> <laughs> now you've been so watching. That, in brain. that large chondrule, is that, that it looks like something in it. That's not a C A I. Yeah, is it? Exact, exactly. It's, uh, it's, I don't think it's a CAI. Um, I haven't looked at it under the microscope real carefully, but um, uh -huh. the, uh, the, the round type CAIs can have that sort of general appearance, but they tend to be much more white. Uh, it colored. almost looks transparent. Yeah. Um, I'll have to look at it under the, uh, under the microscope, uh, but uh, one thing that I learned a while back that I I was uh, quite surprised by is that the the chondrules in um, CB threes tend to contain uh, quite a large amount of glass, oh. um, and uh, like some of the thin section photos that Marissa has, has uh, posted recently. There's these beautiful little olive bean crystals that are floating in the glass, and it's just a a beautiful, beautiful effect, and uh, one that you don't see without uh, the uh, uh, modified reflected polarized light. Hmm. That actually, well, thank you very much for showing those things off, man. Like I can't believe the beauty of the chondrules packed in that 700 grammar. That's just unbelievable, man. Uh, you mentioned Marissa, and I don't want to gloss over that because Marissa's been taking some amazing um, thin section photography pictures. Um, so I'm going to tap her on the shoulder for next week or whenever she's with us <laughs> next. Um, I ask that uh, we, if I'll, you know, you send me some pictures and I'll scroll through them and you can just describe and talk to us about what you enjoy uh, about thin sections and thin section photography. And uh, you can talk us through your process or just tell us your favorite ones because we'd love to hear from you. And you really do a fantastic job that I can't do on thin sections photography. So I'll tap you on the shoulder next time you're available to present on that, if you don't mind. So. Um, I am going to go now to Chris Monk and see what he has to say. 
Hey everyone. So you I've heard? actually been talking about this stone for a couple of weeks, but I can't get away from it. And I <laughs> put my put my zoomer on today because I wanted to um, show some Ooh. neat features. Yeah, so. so this one chondral or maybe clast, I don't know how yeah. you want to talk about it. I mean, yep. you can, it, it almost like it, it has its own melt veins in it. And I'm yeah. not for sure if that's accurate, but I wanted to ask about it. Yeah, that's a very interesting one. The, um, uh, the, the lighter colored areas of it have little white flecks. So, so to back up a step, this, this is a, 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 a type three ordinary chondrite. Uh, and quite possibly a primitive one, one of the lower uh, 3.xx um, uh, classifications. And they commonly will contain, well, not that common, they will sometimes contain um, carbonaceous inclusions. And I think that's what that is, especially seeing the little white flecks in the gray part. The black part in between those lighter gray areas is really, really interesting. I, I don't know, I don't know what that is right off, but I would like to point out one other thing. So uh, Stephen Amara and I and a few other people have been working on trying to figure out what are the clues for whether a, a meteorite might be a 3.XX or a 3.X, you know, the, the lower groups. And if you'll notice the chondrules to the left of uh, that uh, black inclusion show a lot of little pores, the mm -hmm. little chondrules. And those seem to be correlated with uh, primitive uh, meteorites. So uh, the price of this one went up from five bucks a gram, I'm sure. And, <laughs> and this is probably just shot this myself is, in the foot because I don't own a slice yet and want to. <laughs> well, this is actually the piece that I decided to keep. And I think Arthur has the sister slice. Yes, he hasn't, he hasn't received it it's, yet. <laughs> it, it's going to be in the mail uh, at the post office. I haven't had a chance to get down there, but I'm going to. And then I'm going to put that under the microscope and I'm just going to spend hours upon hours of just drooling viewing it yeah. yeah there's lots of little pores in the chondrules that one that one might well be primitive yeah this, might be what? this is a uh, primitive, primitive. Uh, gotcha. one clo closer to 3.00 hmm. i'm not yeah, this is definitely zero but it's that direction it's definitely one of the coolest ones i've ever cut into and i cannot stop looking at it under magnification yeah, yeah. absolutely there, yeah, um, Marissa just agreed through chat that she's going to show off her thin sections for us. So awesome. Thank you. What we need you to do is get that thing hooked up to a microscope on video for us, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Once I, once I get some, right now I do everything off of my tablet um, because I don't have a camera for my computer, but my microscope actually does connect to my computer. So maybe I'll call in twice next week and we can we can look at some close-ups. That would be awesome. I totally appreciate that. We have our last show and tell of the night with Christian, who I think may be a first time uh, viewer. So thank yeah. you for joining us. Well, uh, thank you, Topher. And since you are talking about chondrules, I want to show a uh, um, very small one. And this is an unclassified um, um, chondrite. And I'm not sure, but I was thinking that this may be a uh, type three uh, um, high metal. Um, because of the, the, I don't know if, if the chondros show well, but yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I was curious because I, I have been learning and something that um, 
I have seen is that some types um, like L, LL, and H have different, um, the chondros, different size. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Yes. And, and can I ask, what, um, what is the correlation of the, the high metal with the small um, chondros? Yeah. It, we don't know exactly why, or at least I don't know exactly why. Um, uh, but the um, in in the the lower uh, uh, classes, the, the the less metamorphosed uh, classes of, of ordinary chondrites, the LLs tend to have much larger chondrules. The Ls are sort of in between, and the Hs have small chondrules. Now that's that's a generality, uh, it is quite possible for uh, meteorite, uh, ordinary chondrites of all classes to have occasional uh, very large chondrules, like the one sort of in the upper right uh, of that cut surface there. Um, but uh, when you look at the average or mean chondrule side uh, size, then uh, you'll you'll see. Uh, less metal, bigger chondrules. That's almost perfect. Yeah, that is a, thank you for that, Pat. That is a beautiful chondrule right there. And Christian, if you look over to the left on that slice, you'll see a chondrule that is split directly in half. Yes. Right there. That is cool. Yeah. That's um, in, in my opinion, this has a little too much melt and a little too much um, matrix in between the chondrules to be a type three. Um, Pat, can we get your opinion on that? Yeah, I think I, th I think you're right. Uh, I think this is probably more likely to be a type four uh, than a type three um, because of the uh, uh, abundance of, uh, of matrix, the material in between the chondrules. Uh, now, it's hard to tell um, from, you know, pictures over, over zoom, but, uh, yeah, it appears to be a type four. Nice. But, uh, uh, still a very beautiful meteorite and another one you can get lost in. Look at, I mean, there's so much complexity in there. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and Christian, nice I totally colors. appreciate you joining us, um, and showing off. There's, there's no, uh, like I said, there's no egos here. We're just meteorite lovers looking uh, looking to share our meteorites with everyone. So really glad you were able to find us and join us live and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And so we, we do take um, new viewers, uh, new contributors, and also questions. So if you have a subject that you'd like us to discuss, please leave it in the comments and don't forget to like this video. That was a wonderful hangout, and I really appreciate my Knowledge Bolide -like crew picking up the slack for me today. Really, totally appreciate it, guys. Thank you, Mike Kelly, for the basalt uh, presentation. And Maxime, stay sexy, buddy. <laughs> I'll see you guys all next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care. Take care. Night, Topher. <laughs>